Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 48. Today we are talking about smallish two-player games. That's the best name I could come up for it. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. And as you can tell, he is off in another state doing something, uh, something work-related. I'm on site with a client. <laughs> As always, this podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. If you want to help out the podcast and keep it going, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. But for now, let's talk about some games. So we've been trying to do these monthly themes. They've been kind of pushed back a bit, but I think we'll catch up in March because we're going to keep it a little bit more focused for the March theme. This is technically what we were focusing on in February, and I think it was probably a bit too much to kind of handle in a month this kind of idea of smallish two-player games so i played a a little bit of a a handful of games but not quite as much as i'd wanted to but we have enough to talk about we have a nice list of games to go over some good some mostly good some a bit more eclectic than others some you've probably heard of hope maybe some couple that you haven't but i think there's a lot of interesting things to talk about Now, this podcast will be more just kind of going game by game, but there are a couple of broader points that I thought of with regards to two-player games. And of course, we talked last month about abstract games, which are often two players, and I think all the ones we talked about are two-player games. And so I don't want to go too much into kind of the broader ideas of two-player games because we talked a lot about that already. But there are two things I thought of. First is that in when you're looking at kind of modern games from a two-player perspective, a key factor that makes those games different than kind of your typical, especially when you're looking at Euro-focused design, is that there is just more interactivity. And that's just inherent in a two-player situation because it is zero-sum. So if your opponent gets knocked down by X amount, that's effectively the same as you gaining x amount whereas in a multiplayer scenario that's not true at all and so oftentimes i think designs will have to reach for interactivity in a multiplayer game whereas in a two-player game maybe sometimes they're trying to take away from it because it's so much so much of that is is just built into the fact that it's two players the second idea I thought of when I was looking at this list of games is that there are kind of two different styles of games that are represented here. One is the race, which you'll see a lot more in multiplayer games, but in a two, in two-player games, there are games that are races. In other words, you're trying to be the most efficient or the fastest at reaching some kind of goal. It doesn't necessarily have to be a race theme for it to be a game that's effectively a race. And then there's the tug of war, which we'll see a lot in two-player games. A couple games incorporate both of them. So... If you look at a more complicated game, like I've been playing a lot of Magic the Gathering online, that incorporates elements of both. You're racing to deplete your opponent's hit points, or sometimes uh, if you're trying to mill them out, you're racing to mill them out. But it still has a lot of tug-of-war interactivity in terms of the board state that the creatures have. That's a game that incorporates both. A game like uh, Anthelion, which we'll talk about in a bit, is pretty much just a tug of war. It's very much centered on that. Uh, but a game like Targi is is mostly a race where you're just trying to be the most efficient and progress furthest in the time allotted. Those are just the ideas that came to mind when I was looking at the list of games. Yeah, and kind of going along with that idea of the two-player zero-sum idea... I think you and I kind of disagreed on, about this point on Dominion in that you like Dominion best at two players, and I think it becomes a little reductive at two players and more rich at three players. And that's because a two-player Dominion is a, very much a, a zero-sum game like you're talking about. And I think some of these other games that I perhaps like a little bit better at two players is there's still some of that element of whenever your opponent loses, you're gaining on net. But I think if there are different categories that you're racing within, or if there are certain thresholds you have to meet, uh, I think it enhances the strategy as a general statement, where more than a strict tug of war, where winning by one point is equal to winning by a million points. Yeah, the Dominion example is actually very interesting, because I think as you 
gain players, it becomes less, you know, that's true for really any game, but it's, I think it's really stark in Dominion where it becomes less, or it becomes more race-like with more players, even though all or nearly all of the attack cards or the direct interaction cards will affect all opponents equally. I think that's true. I don't know. Are there any attack cards or interact interactivity cards in Dominion that only target one opponent? I think generally attacks target all opponents. I think they always target all. So is there, there is there certain, one that affects your neighbor? I mean, there's a card like Masquerade, which you're passing to the left, but everyone's you passing. Pass. To the left. Everyone passes, but um, you know, there's depending that other on card, who you're next to, like it could be, expedition or something, where the person to your left chooses what you get, but that's not an attack. So yeah. Yeah, most of Dominion affects everyone equally, but there's certainly a, a, a change in feeling when you add players in Dominion. And I think, honestly, I mostly like Dominion at two players best because it's mostly just because it's quicker. Because I see Dominion as a game, it's very much a strategic game. And so while I do enjoy the tactics of changing what you're doing based on what your opponents are doing in multi, especially in multiplayer games of dominion i think i equally or even more enjoy like picking a strategy at the beginning testing it out and then trying something new the next game i like getting through the games really quickly in that sense but i can see why you guys like it with better with multiplayer I think just at three the strategy becomes a little more dynamic and you can get more of a rock paper scissors more than a just a, more than a tug of war, and I think that is a more interesting strategic situation than the two player. Yeah, I, I can't really dispute that. I just prefer the quicker game. But you're probably right that it's more inter- it's certainly more tacti- tactically interesting because you have more room to maneuver in a two player game of Dominion. You're really kind of counting your turns really carefully. And you know that unless you're going for an alternative strategy, it's really just a race to get the fifth province. Um, And that's something you can keep track of a lot more. With more players, there's more to muddy that up, especially if you have attack cards in there. So it won't necessarily be kind of a race to get the engine and then, okay, get, you know, get four provinces in the next four to six turns, uh, like a two-player game often is. But... I have a feeling we're going to be doing a Dominion podcast relatively soon about some of the newer expansions. So let's move on from that and talk about the first game on the list, which uh, I I wanted to start with something that a lot of people would be familiar with. I'm, I am 100, I'm 99.9% certain that this is the highest rated two player game that we'll be talking about on the BGG list. Actually, I'm hundred percent certain it's like in the top twenty or top. It might be in the top ten. Uh, that's Seven Wonders Duel, which I think is a very clever game, um, and I think this will kind of lay a good foundation for the rest of the list. It's it's mostly a race, I would say, with some tug of war elements in terms of more passive, right? It's more of a indirect interactivity thing where you're trying to block opponents from certain cards. Uh, So for those who haven't played Seven Wonders Duel, uh, if you have played Seven Wonders, which is a bit more likely probably, it incorporates a lot of the engine building aspects where you're gaining the ability to get resources and you use those resources to build things that get you points later in the game. But the big change with the two-player game is that instead of a pick-and-pass style draft, there is a on the table draft, I guess you could say, where all of the cards for that round are displayed in a kind of pyramid shape overlapping each other, where roughly half of them are face down and half of them are face up. So when a card, and you go back and forth, you know, picking cards, and when a card no longer has any other cards laying on top of it, covering part of it up, then it gets flipped over if it was one of the face-down cards. So you always have some option of selecting a card. I mean, you can get stuck where you just only there's literally only one card to select in some situations. But usually you'll have an option, but the card that you select also determines what options your opponent has. So there's a lot of gameplay in the tempo of trying not to give your opponent options or trying not to 
especially reveal new cards that you don't know about uh, for your opponent to select on their next turn, which I find very, very interesting. Yeah, kind of calling back to last month with Go, we touched on how much that game is about tempo, and this game, the that position of the cards of what you reveal was one of the most interesting decisions decision points in this game because I think we both experienced this case of, well, this is the best card for me, but I really want the card under it, and we both want the card under it, so I don't want to be the one to reveal it. And you try to do other things to force the the your opponent into that kind of uh, zugzwing, to use a chess term, of being forced to make a move where any move is bad. Where the, the zugzwing is where any move, you're not actually in danger, but any move is bad, and you would prefer to pass, but you are not allowed to. So you're forced to move and end up and therein lose the game, or at least you know some position. And this uh, game had a lot of that in the positioning of the cards and there. Uh, the main tug of war element, I think, was on the military track. So if one person got too far ahead on military, they that was a win condition. But that oh, seemed right, pretty yeah, hard. It literally that has seemed a pretty tug hard of war to get there. To. Yeah. Uh, same with science. You, if you collect a whole bunch of science, you'll end up winning the game. Although that's very difficult. And those, those are kind yeah. of those are aspects of the game that I don't think work entirely. I can see why they're there but they're not as compelling as their counterparts in the base Seven Wonders, the original Seven Wonders. Uh, they're mostly there to add a little bit of spice into the game because if you completely ignore one of them, your opponent can win the game, but it doesn't take a whole lot to keep yourself from them hitting one of those win conditions. You just need a little bit, you know, a, a couple plays to, to stop that from happening throughout the game will be enough. But yeah, the Zugs. How do you pronounce that? Zug Wang. Zugs Wang. Zugs Wang is how I've always said it. I'm pretty, probably wrong, but is that German? I think so. Okay, it's like Z U G Z H A N G or something. Zugs Wang. Okay, I think that's a, that's such or, an interesting concept that you take a dynamic of a game that's usually not part of the actual gameplay. The idea that you can't pass that you have to do something and incorporating that incorporating that into part of the strategy is very, very interesting. The kind of inverse of that is triumph and tragedy where there's a lot of strategy built around passing and the idea that around, you know, a, a certain phase of the game doesn't end until everyone passes in succession. But once you pass, you can come back in later uh, which mm -hmm. is kind of the opposite side of the coin. But in Seven Wonders Duel, it, and I've played it only a handful of times, but it feels like that, the back and forth in like manipulating your opponent into selecting suboptimal cards or forcing them to open up a lot of new choices for you seems to be the central aspect of the game, which was unexpected the first time I played it. But the more, you know, the few times I've played it since then, I find it very, very compelling. I understand why people like it so much. The moment you stop comparing it to the base game, I think is when you have more fun with it because that dynamic is so new and interesting that you don't really see in the base Seven Wonders. Like there's hate drafting in regular Seven Wonders and it's necessary in regular Seven Wonders with the science cards, but it feels so much different when everything's in front of you and you can kind of count through the turns and the steps. Okay, I do this, then they have to choose one of these two, and which opens up me on the other one, which means that, you know, they're the one who unlocks these two cards and I'll get the option at them. Um, that's complicated by the fact that some of the wonders you can build in Seven Wonders Duel will let you do two turns in a row. Uh, so you can you can kind of interrupt and reverse that flow so that if the tempo was forcing you to reveal a bunch of cards if, with strategic wonder plays, you can, you can change that, uh, which is cool. Yeah. And I think that's probably the gateway to any mid <laughs> beyond beginner strategy is how and drafting the wonders and then when to use them. Oh, I completely agree. 
yeah, really understanding the wonders and understanding how the, that can change the tempo of the game is probably where m most of the strategy, or at least like intermediate strategy is. But it was fun. I think we only played, or I've only played once. I think you've played maybe a few times. Um, but it was a fun game. I don't know six. if either of us would rate it in the top 20 or 10 or whatever, but it was a solid game. I really like it. I don't know if it would, I don't think it would make my top 20. It might make my top 50. It would, okay. I think by this point, it would certainly make my top 100. And I think it did last year. Uh, I think it would remain there. I don't know where on, on that list it would be. Uh, I play it pretty inconsistently since none of us own it. So I've played it at cons and then with a particular friend when I visit him back on the West Coast. But uh, I, I think it's a very good game. The next one on the list is Hanami Koji, which is one of the games I've actually gotten around to reviewing by the time this podcast goes up. And this one was really sold to me as an incredible two-player game. I don't think it's as good as those people suggest, but I do think it is a very good game. It does... It, it creates a very streamlined area control game experience with two players and which is something that didn't seem I, I wouldn't have understood how it could be done before seeing the game and the way it does it is through I split you choose which is just from a it's a great a it's a great mechanic <laughs> conceptual from a conceptual point of view is just br a brilliant solution it's kind of like one of the foundational methods of game theory of a way of equitably uh, splitting things up mm -hmm. because one person basically says these are the two options or x options and then everyone else chooses one before that person so it's in their interest to make them as equal as possible but in this game especially you're also trying to guess what the other person will value more and where that will line up with the things you value less so that you still come out ahead or at least with something valuable right yeah it's all about timing your your big splits and setting up situations in which you kind of win either way which is incredibly difficult in a game where you're going to be playing 10 cards total and two of them are just kind of discarded so really eight yeah. cards that are going to be placed on the board so it's so streamlined and so tight and, and you only get to keep five of those eight cards that you play <laughs> right and you only actually choose one of them like one you choose okay this one's yeah. on my side the other one is all i present these three or four cards to you in a in and you choose uh who gets what which again, from a conceptual point of view, is so, so good. Because the tug-of-war thing, it's built into a lot of these two-player games, but it's kind of a difficult, I wouldn't say particularly difficult, but it's certainly an obstacle to two-player design. Because if you strip it down too much, it just becomes very, very dull, right? If it's just a tug-of-war, you know, I have one strength, you have two strengths, so I guess you win. That's com That's very dull. So you have to spice it up with... In this case, a lot of uncertainty about what the opponent has in their hand and what their plans are, which very much mirrors, you know, what I think we would say is actually, I think we would both agree to the two best two player games out there, Twilight Struggle and Netrunner. That's the same exact dynamic. The question of what they have in their hand, that uncertainty and that lack of knowledge drives both of those games so much and Hanami Koji really capitalizes on it as well in a much, much, much simpler game. And also the uh, hidden information of a deck in Hanami Koji and Twilight Struggle. It's a shared deck in Netrunner. Of course, you each have your own deck, but for example, in Netrunner, you might know after the first couple rounds, you'd be like, okay, they're playing this archetype of the deck. You know, mm -hmm. they're playing this faction and they're kind of going for the strategy. So I expect these sorts of things but you don't know which cards they've drawn until, you know, you've gone a ways through the deck, you can start making assumptions. So you have to balance your predictions of what they're trying to do with the odds that they have that particular card. In a similar idea of, you know, these other games, Hanami Koji, you say, well, the fives are the most valuable, and I know where two of them are, but there are three more out there. So even if I get both of these, I could still lose that. And if I invest in it, it, you, 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 you open yourself up to risk, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and I like this game 
because basically everything you do, you have to give something up. And it's yeah. not certain what you gain or what, what you will keep. Uh, and you can try to set up situations with, uh, you know, I, I split you choose where you're like, well, I'm going to get at least one of these and then either this or that. So I'm going to, I'm going to win this one and at least tie you on another one because you're fighting with these different categories or colors, whatever you want to call them in the game, they're skinned as geishas, which have a number of cards and they're worth X points equal to the number of cards. I think it does it very well. And the main problem I have with it that keeps it out of like legend status of a game is that it's just a bit too streamlined and simple in that you can kind of look back on the game and say, okay, I really didn't have a, an actual choice here, right? If I, Over the two kind of weighing the odds decisions I was making, either one was going to fail in the end, especially once you get to the later rounds uh, when you have to, when kind of, if you don't, claim enough points or an, enough geishas to win the game. You go to a next round and all the ones that you did win stay on your side. So your opponent has to actually win them outright to switch sides. If it ties, uh, it stays on your side. And in that situation, oftentimes I think that, you know, when I look back on who had what cards, it's like, okay, I was kind of doomed from the beginning just based on the selection of cards which could be true of other games like that, you know, card-based games that are tug of wars, but they're much more obscured. It's because Hanabi Koji is so streamlined, that kind of analysis is also streamlined, which is a weird complaint, but uh, I, I still think it's, it's excellent. Yeah, it was definitely fun. I think we played this one for the first time at PAX Unplugged last year in our um, Fight Club apartment. <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, what we're calling it now? No, I just thought that was a funny reference. Um, yeah, you can it's, you can choose to explain of, that or not. I will choose to explain that it was full <laughs> of very stylish, modern, but very poorly constructed furniture and furnishings. So uh, you, you described it as the apartment that Tyler Durden hates, <laughs> basically. Right? Yeah, the scene in Fight Club where he's talking about all the IKEA furniture and all that. It very much yeah. looked like that. Moving on to Anthelion, which is a button shy game that I reviewed. I don't know if it's actually been out yet. If it's not out, it should be out fairly soon, at least the shipping on that Kickstarter, uh, which is very, very much a tug of war game and also a, a small game as all the button shy games are. And that one it is, it is quite literally a tug of war. It's literally a tug of war over five things at once. And yeah, you just got to get enough points to your side of the war, and you win the game. Uh, the key with Anthelion, though, is that all of the characters that you're tugging and warring over... That sounded awkward, but uh, they're tugging all... Tugging and warring over. All right. I, I, I've got to stop with the tug of war puns here. Uh, all of those characters have special abilities that you can activate, and they do various things of usually interacting with the other characters that are on the board or interacting with the point system in some way. I thought it was actually quite fun. I would put it up there with Hanami Koji uh, in terms of a very small box, or in this case, small wallet game that provides a great two-player experience with a, with a lot of thought involved. Again, just like Hanami Koji, where you have to kind of think about how your choices impact your future choices, uh, and Thillian's all about finding the correct line of play where you kind of force your way into winning some points in the end. There's a lot of, not a lot, but there's some cards that interact with like the discard pile, which is very fun. And there are some cards that are clearly more powerful than other cards, uh, which I think works in that game because both sides have equal access to them. Uh, so kind of working around those big power cards can make for interesting gameplay. Yeah, this is definitely an interesting one, but I don't think I like it as much as you did. It kind of, I would almost say it comes down to like one big decision. At, at some point in the game, there's like one turn that kind of just decides it. And either that's either like a mistake from one player or, or a, a swing. And it kind of, I think it kind of just resolves from there. Uh, I don't know if that's actually accurate, but that's kind of how I think about it. I can see that happening, I suppose, or like the wrong card comes out at the wrong time. I think there's 
there's enough counterplay in the game to keep that from happening. In the situations where I lost a game and I'm like, man, I really didn't feel like I had a chance there. When I look back on it, I was just kind of playing too aggressive. I think it's it's very much a game where you have to play defensively and then pick your pick your moments, which is somewhat limiting, right? Some ga- a couple of times I was like, okay, I'm going to try to play very aggressive here and just get rush out points, and that didn't work at all. I, th- I think you're kind of forced to play very safe and contemplative. Uh, but once I did that, I, I enjoyed it. And I guess it's kind of like two sides of a coin, you know, on on the Amphelian side, it's a quick game. So you're like, oh, I messed up. We'll try to go again. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, we talked about lines of play in in Go most especially. And obviously a mistake there can turn a whole little Joseki or a fight or a region. But there are generally six others or eight others or something. And the sequence of play is not like I messed up, you win the next turn or you win in two turns. It's you need to play out 10 more moves to actually realize that you made a mistake, maybe. Yeah, and then you um, uh, rage rage quit and rematch it on, on the <laughs> I've been doing that so way too early in these games because I'm like, oh, I cannot believe I lost that fight. I've lost this whole chunk of the board. Rematch. But I probably should play out more end games. <laughs> Even if I'm losing quite badly. And then... Another game uh, that I got right around the time of Anthelion, which I also reviewed, is Master of Wills, which has almost identical core gameplay mechanisms. The same thing. You have characters on the board. You're tug of warring them back and forth along a linear path between you and your opponent. Uh, and there are various abilities and stuff you can activate. Uh, but where Anthelion goes for as lean as possible with individual characters have having maximum impact on the game board master of wills kind of went for a dump lots of cards on the board and make the initial puzzle a bit more informationally complex i suppose rather than strategically complex so whereas in anthelion your your thoughts about what to do on your turn will look a lot more like what you would think about in a chess game where it's like, okay, if I do this, what is their reasonable move? And then if they take that reasonable move, am I left in a better position? Do I have any play from there? Can it, does it activate something uh, where I can gain tempo on them? In Master of Wills, it's literally like, okay, which move gives me the most points among these 15 cards? Uh, and you just kind of go down each card. Okay, this one will give me five points or secure five points. This one will secure six points. So I'll do that one. So I didn't like it nearly as much as as Anthelion. I thought it was a bit bloated. And when it did introduce powers and actions you can do, they were severely underutilized because you can only activate a couple of them per game, like a maximum of eight. But it ended up in reality being four or five at the most. And that's if you really focused on it. So, Isn't this the one that was like the pseudo deck builder that wasn't really, that you didn't even get to use your deck? Yeah, and it has a whole thing where it's like, okay, you can build your hand of, you can build your deck, and it's like a 20 card deck around there, and at most you will get to eight of those cards. Like you'll, at, at most you will see 10 play eight, or see 11 play eight, or something like that. But in reality, you, I think the most, and it, the most action cards anyone ever played in one of my games was maybe six, but probably five. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it was just a big waste of time to build your deck because you're like, wow, I'm never going to actually see most of this or have any chance to, right? Like, it's not even like most any deck construction game I've ever played where there are different strategies of like, you know, scrying for cards or digging for cards. Uh, I guess tutoring is the word, tutoring for cards or being more aggressive or being more defensive, the, the strategies seem very restrained and more focused on, okay, this card is just kind of better than this other card. But the tug of war part, the puzzle was kind of interesting, but I found it particularly interesting because we got it right at the same time as Anthelion. And I'm going to go on a tangent now. We have, we've been pretty good so far in this podcast, but it's tangent time. So buckle your seatbelts. Well, um, as you've said on many occasions, you can never have too many tangents. Yeah, but I, you know, I'm I'm 
I thought we we're I thought I was going to be good here. I thought I was going to stay stay the course, talk about what we'd written down. But okay, this is a Master of Wills versus Anthelion is a perfect example of why analyzing games from the perspective of it has these mechanisms is just kind of a bad way of analyzing games. So I see a lot online with like board game recommendation things. There's a Reddit thread for that. And people are asking all the time on ver- on Facebook, on Twitter and everything. It's like, I like these games. What other games do you think I'll like? And you can get some information that way, certainly. And you can certainly see some stuff about their tastes. Like, for instance, how complex of a game they they want to get. Or generally, if they like direct conflict or not. But if someone's like, ooh, I like Agricola, that doesn't mean that they're going to like every worker placement game out there. And this was made more clear to me when I got in a discussion on a board game reviewer's Facebook group about this idea that I've seen on various places and people, a lot of reviewers tend to do, which is if they're reviewing a game that they do not like, they will try to see the pros and cons, or they say they try to present the pros and cons of every game, that every game has pros and cons, and that even games they adore, they should find some negative for it, and games, even if they hate the game, they should find some positive for it. And oftentimes that's phrased in terms of, well, you know, even if you don't like the particular mechanism of the game, someone else probably likes that mechanism, so you should say, Something along the lines of, well, this wasn't for me, but if you like this thing, you'll probably like the game. And to me, that just fails to capture so much of the board game experience and what makes board games interesting to be almost entirely useless. Because just because someone typically likes a certain mechanism doesn't mean that they'll like every implementation of that mechanism. It means they're more likely to, And so it has minimal predictive usage, I guess, or recommendation usage. But if you're going to be analyzing and reviewing a game, you should be going beyond the description of the mechanism. That's just kind of a broad guideline. And you should be looking at the details of how that's implemented. So when I see two games where they do the same thing, but one of them fails and one of them doesn't, it makes it so much more clear to me that... As a board game reviewer and someone who's analyzing board games, that I need to be focusing on the particulars of it because that's what's not captured by the broad description. All that to say, Anthelion, I think, does the tug of war on a linear track thing pretty well, and Master of Wills kind of reached way, way too far and couldn't build up a game around its aspirations. Tangent over. That was more of a rant. Yeah, a ranting slash tangent. Art. Rantant? I don't think that's a good uh, portmanteau. No, I, please don't. <laughs> I'll never I don't say know, that I don't, again. I don't think that's that. It's probably not as bad as listicle. Ugh. But it's that. No, don't. I don't no. mind listicle as a word. Ugh. Ugh. It's disgusting. I don't mind it. I guess it kind of there sounds ha- like tentacle, but I don't know. There, there has to be a better word for whatever they're trying to describe there. Well, it's just whatever an article that is a list, right? But. Whatever. <laughs> I usually hate these kinds of things. That one doesn't. I don't mind it. It seems somewhat useful. I thought we had agreed that this word that that word was gross. Like two weeks ago, this this came up. No, I think I used it, and then you and a couple other people on the Slack were like, "Ew." I don't know what I responded with, but I, I don't mind it. Okay. Anyways, I have not played Master of Wills, but you you have described it as kind of trying to do too many things and not really succeeding in any of them. Yeah. And being the less for for it, whereas Anthelion you liked more because it it kept a focus and executed that one thing, and it did so at least reasonably well uh, to be enjoyable. Yeah, and there are other reasons, but that's kind of the broad uh, perspective of why one works and one doesn't. Although it did result in one of the funnier comments I've gotten on one of my reviews. Oh yeah, you gotta of- fight me, bro. Right? Yeah, yeah. Let me find it real quick. Hold on. It was basically, uh, you're dumb, play me, and I'll beat you 10 out of 10 times or something. Yeah, let's advertise the website here. Let's see here. 
says, Wow, you have successfully given the most uninformed review of Master of Wills I have ever seen. It is quite incredible how far off the mark you are in both your understanding of the game and the strategic balance of it all. Why don't you go download the app and try to beat me even one time out of ten if you think the game is based on luck? You are so off, it's comical. There is a reason nobody reads your reviews. Nice job. Comments like that make me smile, especially when there's a challenge involved. So I replied, I would love to take you up on that challenge. And then uh, they haven't responded. So Amy, who commented on my review of Master of Wills, I would still love to take you up on that challenge. I think I could beat you one time out of ten. And just let me know, you know, reply to that. We shall work something out. If you like, we could even stream it. Because I do think that the game has a very large luck component. And Thillian does as well. But it has certain actions that mitigate that. Master of Wills was just too many cards. And it was all about kind of figuring out what the best play was. Rather than deeper strategic analysis based on like your opponents. What your opponents could do. It's more like, okay, this card is going to gain me more points. And... I want to both gain those points and block my opponent from gaining those points, so I will do. I will activate that card. Anyways, enough about Master of Wills. Let's move on. Let's to move a, on to a game that we played in another country. Oh yeah, on vacation. Yeah, Targi, which uh, we've only gotten one play of it so far. I'm hoping to get a review out before the end of the month, get a couple more plays in. Uh, but I thought it was enjoyable. This one is, you know, it has interactivity as as almost every two player game does. But this one, of all the games we're going to talk about, this one is definitely more on the race side of things. You know, it's it's a two-player specific Euro game, basically. It is a gather resources, turn those resources into points game on a very simple level. But what makes it compelling is its action selection mechanism. Because the resource conversion part of it is really kind of boilerplate standard stuff. There's like three resources there are cards where you spend those resources and you get kind of pretty vanilla powers and victory points and some set collection stuff so the game i think really relies on its action selection thing which is grid based and we all know what i think about grids in board games spoiler alert they're awesome there should be more of them more grids we just need to make spreadsheet the board game Although I've heard that's what Arkwright is, but I haven't played that yet. You've got a 5x5 five five grid. You've got this one pawn that kind of walks around the outside, and that's the essentially the round marker. It also blocks that pawn, uh, that card. And each card on the outside is an action. And you have three pawns that you place on the outside. Uh, you can't place on the corners. Those are special raid events. So basically you lose some resources um, every quarter of the game. And then... After you're, you, you can't play on the same row or column as someone else. And then after you've each played your three pawns, you get to take any cards on the interior, the nine interior three by three that you intersect. Uh, so, you know, if you're on row one, column one, then you get the one, one card action. And those are either resource cards or tribe cards, resources you can guess. And the tribe cards are the ones you will buy them for some number of resources and they go into your set collection and they will give you some victory points and generally some power that isn't wild, but it can kind of adjust your strategy a bit or give you a boost in one direction. And so the, again, two player games tempo of the, the sequencing of putting your pawn on a column and blocking that from anyone else. And then the other person places on a row of the card that you probably wanted and blocks you out of that row. And consequently the card in your column that you wanted and you kind of go back and forth trying to keep up. It was pretty cool. Yeah. It takes the idea of like worker placement where you go on a space and then you prohibit someone else from going on that space and adds another layer to it because well, it, it makes it there two-dimensional, multiple, quite literally. <laughs> yeah, it makes it two-dimensional, right? Because you are simultaneously blocking an entire column or row, like three action spaces from your opponent, and opening up those for you to potentially use. So there's a bit more balance involved of, is it worth it to, you know, there, in the time we played, I had to think a lot of, 
do I block this row even though I can't really do anything I want on it just because I know that Orion would love to take like two of the cards in this row and I just need to stop him from doing that? Or do I go for something that's going to be a bit more profitable to me and, and, and accelerate my race to victory points? You know, and in a two-player game, those interest those decisions become a lot more interesting. So I, there's, I there's I, there's no king making, <laughs> right? It's again, it's a zero sum thing. So that two dimensional worker placement thing it becomes so much more comp so compelling that I think it lifts the entire rest of the game up. Because you know, I had a great time playing it, but a week later, thinking back on the game, I'm like, wow, the parts of the game other than the action selection aren't that exciting. There's yeah, well, the action selection is the game. And then you yeah. like, once you've placed your pawns, you're like, all right, I get these intersections, I collect five resources, and I convert them to a point, go again. Right, yeah. Uh, there's a little bit with the tribe cards you get, you, you put them into rows, and you're trying to get, like, either sets or... Uh, all, all of a kind, or all one of a kind, each kind or, basically. Yeah. I don't know what you call it, like, the anti-set. I don't think there's a name for that. Unique or something? I don't know. Uh, you're trying to get those, and those will give you some points. If you get all of a kind, it can give you a lot of points, so you got to watch out all for right. that. All right, here. Inter internet proposal. Yeah? If you collect things of the same, it's a set. Right. If you collect things that are different, it's a collection. Whoa. How about that? A collection. I don't know. Because collection means so many other things. What about, like, an assortment? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if you have a name for this... Email yes, me or internet, something. help us with this. <laughs> Comment or email or find me on Twitter uh, because there should be a name for that. It's in a fair number of games, I think. We should we should ask Isaac this. He probably has it in his dictionary. Yeah, or Jeff. Yeah, or Jeff. Probably yeah. in their book. I hope their book comes out soon. I'm really excited to read it. Anyways, that's Targi. I think it's an enjoyable game, at least based on the one play. But got to play it a couple more times. Hopefully, it doesn't become dull. You know, with those kinds it, of games... It, it, it might become dull because the outside is the same every time, I think. Yeah, it is. Uh, so, the inside is constantly changing. And one of the other interesting things is that whenever you take an inside card via an intersection, you swap it out for a card of the opposite type. So, when you mm -hmm. take a res resource card, it becomes a tribe card. So, the layout of the inside is kind of constantly changing. But... Once you've played it a few times, you might kind of know the decks and you know the outside actions, so it might might lose a little luster there. But yeah, who knows? it might. We'll have or, to find out. You never know. In those kinds of, it's always the 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 question with almost any game that does the game become better once you know its like internal mechan not the mechanisms, but the, just knowledge about the cards Car or the tiles like card or yeah. Uh, like what some games potentially oh, okay. will be Here's another, we gotta talk about this for a second. Yeah, go we went ahead. to uh we were at uh Granite Game Summit G2S this past weekend. And this uh, oh, check this out. This is actually gonna tie into our next game. Watch this. I know, this. I'm I'm so excited. <laughs> so, I can see it coming. <laughs> in some games, like Twilight Struggle, you play it and you're like, whoa, that was cool, but I would need to know the cards to play well. Targi, we are not sure, right? We, we right. You, you kind of see the cards, and you're like, well, it might get better because it might just become deeper, like Twilight Struggle is, and there's just layers of trying to outthink your opponent, or the, in the way that like chess is like trying to predict farther into the future than your opponent, or it might just become dull because you're like, well, it's repetitive and it's kind of like, well, I did this and I win, or I do that and I lose, um, and then you have games like Glory to Rome where if you don't know the deck, or even, I think you've also said this about Race for the Galaxy, if you don't know the deck, it's a bad game, and it just requires card knowledge to be fun. Because, and I guess this is true of Twilight Struggle, if you don't have card knowledge and the other person does, you're just going to lose. Yeah, Twilight Struggle does uh, require kind of equal knowledge for, or, or, you know, you can handicap fairly simply with starting influence or starting victory points, but... Yeah, That's, it's, but it's anyways, not that thing. We, we played Glory to Rome this past weekend, which is a fairly well-known game from, what's that guy, Chuddock? Carl Chuddock. Carl, yeah. Carl Chuddock. And it was terrible. Like, it was an abysmal play. And I know a lot of people like it, and I can see 
how it would be fun to build an engine and to become more powerful and get these abilities. But that play was just miserable. Yeah. Like just full stop. Like it was just a bad, it was just a bad experience. Right. And that's kind of the Chuddock thing where the game intentionally is designed to, that someone snowballs out of control, but like you either need to make it end as soon as that happens and make it as short as possible or provide some measure of counterplay. And this one, at least this play of glory to Rome felt like there wasn't any counterplay and the game just kept going longer than it needed to be because it's like, okay, we all know who won the game here. And I think I'm trying to figure out why we don't take issue with this in twilight struggle. Maybe it's because we both kind of played it about the same number of times. We mostly played with each other. And so we kind of gained skill at approximately the same level. Or yeah, same and, and I wrote that in my in my review way back, uh, first article on the site actually, is that you know the ideal situation with Twilight Struggle is that two people learn the game together, and they kind of play mm-hmm. together and learn simultaneously. Because if it's someone who's played a lot and you're teaching someone new, they got to really handicap themselves and, and be careful to not make the game not fun. Which you know. That's probably my primary criticism of Twilight Struggle, but I think how rich it becomes with the card knowledge overcomes that. And maybe that's true for Glory of Rome. I'm not I'm not gonna pin my 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 opinion of the game down after one play, but I feel yeah. like I'll I'll stop it saying it's rough. I see how it could be fun. Mm-hmm. It was not fun to play and definitely requires card knowledge. And I'm not excited to play it again. I probably will, given the opportunity. But it's not a game that I came out of being like, wow, I got smoked because I didn't know the cards and I really want to play this more because it looks so fun. It's like, yeah, theoretically, I could see how that would be fun. And it looked like this other guy was having fun going through the whole deck every, you know, you're building three things a turn or whatever he was doing. But I don't have a lot of desire to go back and play it again. Yeah. Unlike our next game, Innovation, also by Carl Chuddock, which we both think is better. Maybe the internet doesn't, by and large, but it is certainly less punishing without card knowledge. I think you can play it without card knowledge. You might still lose. I, don't, I mean, I've played still, it. But I've played it oh, close to ten times, and I don't feel like I have any card knowledge, <laughs> and yeah. I still find it fun. Um, it's also just more interesting mechanics. Whereas, like Glory to Rome, it's just like draw off the top and hope you get what you want. Yeah, I, I think in innovation, you have so many different ways of acquiring cards. And then the like, even if you're falling behind, you can kind of go to the next age and jump ahead and, you know, do something different. There's like so many more dimensions you can try to compete on mm-hmm. than uh, than Glory to Rome. Yeah. And I got to point out, though, that my first play of innovation was a complete beatdown. And I did not like the game. I'm like, oh, wow. Because I'd played Mott and I before, which is kind of a re-implementation of Glory to Rome. I, I think I've played Mott and I once or twice and basically had the same experience of, that was terrible. I never really want to play again. I guess I could see how it could be fun, but I have no desire to learn the cards. Yeah. And Innovation started getting fun to me the second play, and I haven't seen quite as bad of a beat down with it since. It certainly can spiral, but I think there's a lot more room for counterplay and there's a lot more space there to pivot and find a way to get a foothold and claw your way back. I should also point out that Innovation isn't technically a two-player only game, although I've never heard of anyone who plays it with more than two players. So I'm including it in this category because that's all I've played it with because that seems to be what everyone recommends. But... Yeah, innovation, it still has that Carl Chuddock craziness and a lot of randomness in terms of what you draw, but I think it's very, very difficult to win on every category or to be winning on every single symbol category that you're competing over, and therefore an opponent can find their way back. So the basic premise of innovation is that you're building a tableau, you're going through time it's kind of a sieve game in in theme and you're playing these cards down on a tableau and then once they're on the tableau you can activate them to do very powerful things and you're going through 10 different ages represented by decks of cards and you're trying to progress and score points and then turn those points into achievements and you're 
again, just trying to race towards the end as fast as possible while stopping your opponent. The key to innovation is that when you play cards on the tableau, they all have three different three symbols on them from their th- three symbol types that appear throughout the deck, and then there are three that appear in different portions of the deck. So like the castle symbol will appear in like ages one through four, I think. And then there's like an industrial one that appears in ages four through seven. And then the technology or information, the clock. clock, Yeah. The information one appears in in the end of the game. So there's always like four to five symbols up for grabs. And how it works is that when you activate one of the cards for its ability, each ability is tied to one of those symbols. And if your opponent has the same or more of that symbol displayed on their tableau, they get to do that ability first, which adds so many more dimensions to the game because sometimes that's perfectly fine. A lot of the time, it's not great that they get to do the ability also. Sometimes, though, you can get into situations where it's actually beneficial for you to have the opponent do that ability first where it's like, you know, trading certain cards and or the ability involves like stealing cards in a certain order. And if they do it first, you can kind of steal it back and then gain some. Uh, so there's lots of dynamics like that. And I don't want to do this entirely comparing it to Glory to Roman Montani, but the time, the time between you see, getting a cool card with a cool ability in your hand and being able to use that ability is shrunk down so much in innovation that even if you do get kind of stomped in the game, you still get to activate a lot of fun abilities. Matna and Glory to Rome really lengthen the time between when you get a cool card and when you're actually able to use that cool card because there are more intermediate steps to constructing that, that building. But the... The tug of war on the symbols and innovation is what really makes it cool because those are kind of a power level that isn't necessarily quantified, but you have to try to understand the value of being ahead in various symbols. Whereas point scoring and getting achievements more specifically through your points is the the win condition and that's something you have to weigh. Do I rush out to try to get these points or to, do I build up a better civilization tableau in front of me in, other, in order to have a better foothold for some of the later achievements that require more points and so that I can compete? So there's a lot of really cool tempo in innovation where that I've seen it both ways with my plays, where one time when we were all up in New Hampshire for Matt's wedding, I played and I built up this legendary tableau. I was ahead in everything, but I didn't have any cards that let me score points to actually gain access to the achievements. And I got rushed out by Matt, I think, or were you in that game? I don't remember. You and I played once that weekend and... That was the situation. I don't know if you also played with Matt, um, but you you had by far the better tableau. I might but be thinking I was of that able game. To, I was able to get the sixth achievement somehow, and I just I think I happened. To, I just was able to score enough points and get it before you could. Uh, and it was a really close game. I think I won like a turn before you did. You could have or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I know you and I played again in on vacation, and. Uh, it was kind of the opposite of you scored. a. I, I think I started fast and then you scored a, a ton in the middle game and stole a bunch of my points, but I was building a tableau and ended up with this just lock on the game of like, you couldn't play anything without letting me have it. And I was able to sneak back up and get enough points to, to win. But I think, I think you were ahead like five to three or five to four on the achievements. Uh, yeah. I think um, I got to five pretty quickly. And then I had to like really slow you down and get the cards out. And I, I think again I won just like by one round or something mm-hmm. um, before, or I was just barely ahead of you to to edge out a win there. Yeah, and but that it dynamic. Was like, it was like the opposite board position of the one game you had the dominant, but I was able to just find the scoring points to win. And the other one, I had the dominant, and I was able to eventually convert that. Yeah, or and kind that, of come that back dynamic that. is is so cool because you're trying again, you're trying to measure unquantifiable things with, okay, 
if I go for board position, how valuable is that over going for scoring some more or getting this next achievement? And that combined with the, you know, the very powerful cards and the kind of chaos of the game. But you also uh, have to look at your opponent's board and what yeah. they can steal from you or what symbols you are actually ahead on to be able to activate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It, it's a race to six achievements, but as you go, you're fighting over seven different categories of, of things or something. Yeah, but the review for innovation should already be up by the time this podcast is posted, and I'll have more of my thoughts there. But I do think it is a very, very fun game. I won't be in the mood for it all the time because it, it, it does have still a lot of chaos and a lot of randomness. Mm -hmm. But there's enough there. And I always feel like I'm learning something new about the game every time I'm, I play it because I haven't played enough. You know, every card in, in the whole game is completely unique. There are no duplicates. So it's very hard to get a good understanding of the card. So I always feel like I'm discovering new stuff and new cool powers and cards every time I play, even though I'm playing with the same deck every time. Yeah. And, and sometimes you'll get back to a point where like that level one card that you buried three rounds ago or eight rounds ago suddenly becomes exactly what you need when you uncover it somehow. And, yeah. you know, what used to be like draw, <laughs> draw a two and put back a one which was kind of lame back when you played it is now draw an eight and put back a one or something, you know, yeah. or, 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 or like score a score a two, which is now score a seven. And that, you know, that, that stupid, what did you have that like stupid two leaf level one card or something? Yeah. I wrote that like one for a lot steal of your opponent's top point. It was, card yeah, or something? it was swap your opponent's highest, highest point card with your lowest point card. Yeah. And when it comes out, it's like, oh, I'll swap a one for your three or something. Big whoop. But later on in the game, you were stealing my sevens for your one. Yeah. And it just kept me off getting so many achievements. And that's one of the main engines that you use to score all the middle uh, middle ages, middle objectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is something I, I've seen in multiple games of innovation where you find a card that really works for your situation and you can kind of spam it over and over and over again. But at some point you're using those actions. Yes. Doing something good. And maybe you can leverage that into a win, but you're not using those actions to actually progress your board state. And again, it's the tension between the immediate scoring effect versus the, 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 the boom, <laughs> right? Like in, in, if yeah, you're yeah. playing age of empires, right? You can rush or you can boom. Yeah, and or aggro versus it, it, Yeah, tempo, and, and right? at some point, if your rush isn't killing your opponent, you have to build up your civilization. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a similar idea here, except that you can't actually eliminate someone in this game. At least, except for that one game you played with Matt where you were just completely stuck. But I don't think that's happened since. Yeah, and I, I was also kind of tired at the time, so it's entirely possible that I had cards that could get me out of that situation, but I, I didn't recognize it. Yeah. I don't know. Or maybe, you know, maybe it was just a really skewed game of innovation, because nothing similar has happened since. The last time, game I played with Amber, I won pretty readily, but she I noticed she did not miss one or two plays that could have brought her back, and... Yeah, I think there's there's much more counterplay and in innovation than in Modern Eye or, or Glory to Rome, which really, really spiral out of control yeah. quickly. And now, a callback to a game we referenced earlier, but doesn't quite categorize as a small box two-player game, 13 Days, which is kind of a small box of Twilight Struggle. Yeah, did we reference it earlier? We talked about Twilight Struggle a few times. Oh, Oh, I thought you meant we talked about 13 Days. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we got to play 13 Days a few weeks ago. Uh, we, oh, yeah. It, what was that? Was that President's Day or something? Oh, it or, was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. We went over we to could, Matt's you, house. You, yeah, I had to work most of the day, but you guys played a bunch of Dominion and two-player games. Mm -hmm. and, and then 13 days you and I played 13 Days uh, in the evening. Yeah, which, like Orion said, is certainly inspired by Twilight Struggle, uh, but slimmed down to, what, 40-minute game, probably? 30 minutes? Something like that. Yeah, and it's about the Cuban Missile Crisis rather than the Cold War as a whole. But it it was pretty clever. I would again, it's it's a game I would need to play more to get a more definite opinion on it. It's certainly much more of a bluffing game than Twilight Struggle. Uh, there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of 
bluffing in Twilight Struggle, but it really latches onto that aspect of the game and makes that the center point of the design, where one of the core mechanisms of the game is that you are given three things that will effectively activate and score, and you choose one of them. Yeah, there's one basically, what, like nine scoring categories or something? Yeah, and like regions. You're given yeah. you're given three, and you reveal which three you have, and then you secretly choose one of those three that you're actually going to score. Yeah, so your opponent will know which three potentially you're trying to score for, but you've only chosen one of the three, and vice versa. So it's about figuring out. It's it, you know, it's the Twilight Struggle dynamic of wow, did they play that card, or did they put the influence there because they have the scoring card? Or do they think I have the scoring card there? Or is it just the best, what they think the best play is? And that, that mind game of, are they doing this because they're trying to score that? Or are they just doing it for the long term? And or are they just beca- bluffing? Or are they just bluffing you and, and trying to throw you off the track? So it really condenses the experience down to that dynamic, which is which is interesting. And it holds up fairly well, which, I you know, it's, it's a very... It's a tricky dynamic to make appealing because you could see it easily becoming frustrating. So there needs to be enough of a game around it and other choices that can be made where it's not just a shell game. It's a shell game within a larger construct. And I think it does that fairly well. Yeah, I thought it did a pretty good job of taking Twilight Struggle which it's not Twilight Struggle. It's not as good as Twilight Struggle, and it's not the same game. But it is definitely inspired and has, I don't know, I'd call it like a descendant of Twilight Struggle or something. Taking such a rich, strategically deep game and turning it into something much quicker while still maintaining some interesting decisions. Yeah, and then the other (laughs) aspect of Twilight Struggle that it borrows is the DEFCON track which it makes yep. actually a bit more robust because there are three different tracks that uh, you are being measured on. And if you slip into like level three of one of them by the end of the round, you cause you, you, know, you cause the, the Armageddon and you lose the game. Or if you have two of your three above the second level, or is it all three? All, all three. If you have all, all three, there's like, there's three, there's three levels. If you have all three of if you're if you're on level two of all three of them, you lose. You also, and if you go yeah. to level one on any of them, you lose. Right. Because yeah. De- DEFCON one the is top. the closest to nuclear war. But correct. Yeah. yeah. And Which then was... those three tracks correspond to the three different you could call them regions of the world. Basically, mm-hmm. uh, there's like military battlegrounds, political battlegrounds, and world opinion. Uh, the other thing <laughs> is the brinksmanship that it captures of. When you score a region, or if when you score one of those DEF contracts, you get points for how much higher you are on the track than the other person. But if you go too high, you lose. So you're trying to be higher than your opponent, but not too high. And many of the cards will force or can force the other player to go up on a track, which is where some of the bluffing comes in. And when you score one of those DEF contracts, you also get bumped up, you know, towards towards nuclear war. So there, that's another point where the bluffing and the kind of back and forth, and then it's it's the same card play mechanic, which is or mechanism, which is so brilliant in Twilight Struggle. Of you have a deck of cards, some are neutral, some belong to one faction or the other, and if you play your opponent's event, they get the event, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then you get the the ops points for it. And then also, as you place influence into one of the regions, if you place more than one at a time, you go up on that corresponding def contract, which maybe is good, maybe is bad, but it's something you have to consider. Uh, and then you can also potentially remove cubes or influence from a region, which, if you remove enough, can reduce you on that def contract. So. There's a lot of back and and forth, and you only get four actions per turn um, per, and there's three rounds. But it felt like there's a lot of decisions to make. So, yeah, and and the the idea of removing your influence in order to reduce Defcon is very very cool, Uh, and 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 not something that's in Twilight Struggle, but the idea that oh man, we've we've done too much, we've we've 
gotten too good of a foothold here that it's making our opponents triggered happy and we got to pull back a bit is very thematic and, and interesting. I, I like that dynamic, even if just from a thematic point of view. Mm-hmm. Right after we played 13 Days, though, we played another game, which is fairly similar, called Dual Powers. It's about the Soviet Revolution in Russia, or it wasn't, was it called <laughs> Soviet at the time? I can't remember. I think this was probably the Bolshevik Revolution. Not, yeah, Bolshevik, that's, but, what, that's yeah. what I was thinking of, yeah. Another game, I would say inspired by Twilight Struggle, but less directly a descendant than uh, than 13 Days. Yeah, it's certainly, you know, in that it's an area control game in a in a kind of indirect way, but I think it's it's certainly more distinct from Twilight Struggle. Yeah. So, in this game, you're kind of battling over the districts of uh St. Petersburg or Moscow. I'm not sure which one I it's don't set remember. in. Um I think I believe it's set in in one of those cities and you're moving uh you're ar- deploying and moving your armies around and then similar to Twilight Struggle, only some of the regions will score each round. You each kind of secretly choose a region to score, and then there's a public region that gets scored. So there's some bluffing and some misdirection of, why are you moving troops into this region? Do I need to counter you, or do I need to go for the other one? Do I just secure, do I try to secure the public one? Do I try to secure my private one? Do I try to mislead you? And when do I deploy my big troops and um, and so on, because because you have troops ranging from one to three in power, and generally the cards that let you play your stronger troops also have stronger alternate abilities. So they might let you move an army two spaces, or they might be worth four points if you choose it as the region you're going to score. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I thought it was good. I'd like to play it again. I think the coolest aspect of it were the neutral forces, though, because the game starts with a number of neutral armies on the board. And yeah, there's basically through, like a, mili- a strength one militia in every region. Yeah, and through manipulating your cards, oh, and you got to talk about the calendar system. Yeah, and the calendar thing, you can flip those neutral forces back and forth, which was which was huge. That was a, a massive point of tension in the game that we played at least and how that works is that the timer for the game is literally a calendar and every card you play will advance that calendar a number of days and i can't remember how it flipped if you got well there were landed three on different the th- things if well yeah. two different things. if you land on 15 exactly you get a bonus action which means an extra movement or an extra deployment or something. Mm -hmm. If you land on the last three days of the month, so I think 29 through 31, you also get a bonus action and it slides to 31. But if you play the card that ticks it over to the next month, you get the will of the people, which means you win ties and you control all the militia. That's right. Yeah. If you move it to the next month. Yeah. So So, so you have this decision of like, do I want the bonus action or do I want to take? And if I take that, my opponent basically gets the will of the people because any card from that point will tick to the next month. Mm-hmm. Or do I skip the bonus action and go to the next month, assuming I have an appropriate card? Right. And then what happens if you don't want to switch will the people, but the card you want to play will do that and you have to make those kinds of decisions how that works and you, you also have special isn't... general cards which are one play and they drop a unit and move forward a bunch of days like 10 ish days whereas most of the other cards are one to five one to six in number yeah right. Um, so th- those can be big swing moments when you decide to drop your general and they also have some other ability one will give you will of the people one will let you peek at your opponent's scorecard yeah, but from a thematic perspective, I don't know how it works. It does feel a bit kind of artificially gamey, but I can't deny that it's this very interesting tension and point of decision making over flipping the will of the people thing. Because it's hard to overstate how important those neutral forces can be. And the winning tie breaks thing is just kind of an extra layer uh, of bonus that it gives you. And in our game, you were able to lock in your victory just because you managed to flip the will of the people at the at the key point towards the end of the game. Mm-hmm. So another one I'm excited to play some more. I, I liked it very much. I, I think I liked it a bit more than 13 Days. I think there was a little more 
interesting decision making by a hair in dual powers and i like the look of it quite a bit so that's one that i'll hopefully be playing a, a bit more soon now we go to our last game on the list the Masochist. the most popular game of the last three months six months well this one a wingspan i think okay oh speaking of which did you see the new york times article yeah yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Elizabeth Hargrave got featured in the New York Times. More importantly, though, it means I scooped the New York Times because my podcast was released before their article. So <laughs> there you go, that one Mark on Davis, resume. ahead of the New York Times, <laughs> faster than the New York Times. Anyways, uh, let's talk about KeyForge. I haven't played it in a while, however, because I don't think it's that great honestly but i i thought it would be a good thing to talk about yeah i, I it's have definitely, a review it's, it's a unique it's kind of a unique idea and that's like that's the most interesting thing you can say about it right yeah, i have i have a review halfway written and it's over a thousand words already and i haven't actually talked about the gameplay yet because the concept and what richard garfield is trying to do with keyforge i think like if his desire was actually to make a Magic the Gathering like game that didn't fall into the secondary market, pay to win, non casual culture around the game, he it just didn't work like at all. Like Keyforge has been crazy popular and people are being really, really competitive with it, even though they've done their best to make to disincentivize that. But, anyways, for those who somehow don't know about Keyforge, it is a deck, I can't say deck building because the decks, you buy the decks it's, and they're complete. It's a deck selection. A deck selection game. game. There we go. All the decks are unique uh, through a really cool, innovative uh, algorithmic printing process that Fantasy Flight has developed, uh, which honestly is is very, very cool. Like, I, I want to see what else they do with it. Keyforge is certainly the biggest success they've had. They had an, another board game that used it that, uh, apparently wasn't very good. Uh, Discover, I think it was called. But every deck is unique, and so you get your own deck. It's algorithmically named, which led to some very funny things that where they had to recall decks because the names were kind of obscene, or <laughs> at least implied obscene things. But the gameplay itself, I think, has been kind of overshadowed by the concept of the game. And how it works is that it is unlike many of these style, you know, Magic the Gathering inspired games, it really kind of deviates from the kill your opponent thing because it's not about that at all. It's about racing to unlock three keys. And you do that by collecting Ember, which is just a, a resource. You get a certain amount, and then at the beginning of your turn, you can get a key. However, there's also the battle for board control, like, again, uh, Magic the Gathering inspired games, which ends up being the bulk of it. Because if you have creatures out on the battlefield, you can essentially tap them to get Ember. So you're trying to get opportunities to do that, but also deny your opponent opportunities to do that by killing off their creatures. So there's still a lot of combat there. And I find it all a little underwhelming because the strategy seems to be get creatures on the board, get control, and then just kind of maintain control while getting more ember than your opponent. And But there's there's not as much interaction. Like Magic, there's so many spells you can use to alter the game board. It's not like... I mean, in Magic, it's also get board control and then win, as, right. you know, broadly speaking. But there's so many more cards and abilities and counterplay to just dropping creatures on the board well here yeah in in the and, analogy and is apt, like it, it's right? so it's so difficult to play the cards you want to that i just feel like getting creatures down is such a dominant strategy that there's like i don't see any real counterplay to that it's just kind of a race to see who can get more better creatures down first and then you win yeah well here's the thing the magic analogy is apt because, you know, if you think of your opponent's health as like a resource, you're just gathering that resource, right? It, it, it does kind of end up being a similar thing. But if you were handed a pile of magic cards or a deck made of random magic cards, you would end up getting a deck where you would put some creatures on the board and try to get board position. 
I mean, that's the vast majority of drafted magic decks because that's just how the game is on that kind of mid-range value play. You get alternative styles of decks like super aggro decks or creatureless spell decks or you know super control counter spell decks or mill decks or decks surrounding a specific combo when you have the freedom to hone in and fine tune that strategy if you don't have that ability it's going to default to in both games putting things on the board and getting tempo and I, you could say putting things on the board faster than your opponent does right yeah or just value and tempo right you you yeah. you have but, but, in but magic, there's no you have like, like there's no way to swing that other than just putting things and board advantage right you have all these different aspects of being ahead of your opponent and you try to maintain that the best you can same thing in keyforge the problem is there is no alternative to the like limited style of play and on top of that you're not even drafting. Like, I love magic drafting, and I love that style of play in magic, the kind of mid-range, you know, almost everything's going to be within the middle of the bell curve rather than on the far extremes. And, you know, occasionally you, you get exceptions to that. But when you eliminate the drafting, and then it's just, wow, I have a suboptimal deck that just does middle-of-the-road things, I think that strips away so much of the fun that you get from other similar games and you're left with kind of the mediocre part of it and there's no way to resolve it right you get decks and keyforge and maybe some decks are really the slot machine you know came up aces and you got a really fine-tuned keyforge deck but i'm not going to spend the time and money to try to find something like that all my keyforge decks have very obvious anti-synergies or cards that just don't work together well, or cards that seem kind of bad, or cards that rely on subtypes or things that aren't present in the deck. And it's after a while, it's like, well, I'm just kind of playing with a bunch of mediocre decks, and I wish I could play with better decks, and that I don't find particularly compelling. Because in, in a Magic draft, Right, you're playing, you know, compared to a standard magic, you know, constructed magic deck, you are playing with mediocre decks in draft, but you had the excitement of drafting and you know that everyone else is trying to gain an edge in that same draft and you're trying to find your little thing that you can do better and then it comes down to a lot of really skillful play, which is kind of what Keyforge is trying to do. It's trying to say, okay, we kind of flattened the playing field a bit and it's down to skillful play, but Keyforge has a lot more really extreme powerful effects than Magic does also. Like board, complete board wipes in the common pool of cards and things that will create massive swingy tempo advantages. And everyone, sure, yeah, everyone has access to those, but then it just... A lot of the games of Keyforge I played come down to, okay, I do my turn, I get all these creatures out, and on your turn, you destroy them all. Great. Then I draw up, get some more creatures out, and then you get some more creatures out, and then I kill some creatures, and then you kill some creatures, and we're all, like, smashing against each other and not accomplishing a whole lot. So, I don't know. I don't think it's horrible, but I, I think it's kind of aggressively mediocre based on the games I've played. Yeah, I don't really have anything more to say. <laughs> <laughs> you concur? I mean, you've played it more than I have. I think I only played the couple games with you at the house. You played the tournament at uh, PAX U. Mm -hmm. um, but from... I haven't heard anything that changes my mind on it. I think if you're bought into it, then maybe you enjoy it. But from my perspective of playing a bit of Magic, a lot of Netrunner, and a lot of other board games, it wasn't really compelling. Yeah. And, I don't know, maybe it'll remain being a big hit, but my gut says that it's going to fizzle out pretty quickly. It has the feeling of a fad, because it's like, oh, this cool, they're creating these random decks, and what do I get? And then, once you start playing, the play just doesn't live up to the hype, basically. Mm -hmm. And once you get tired of opening a random deck... I don't know, maybe people love that, but once you get tired of, once you get past that initial interest, it's kind of, there's not that much more there. So that's, that's why it kind of feels like just th this cool new unique thing that doesn't have a lot of substance behind it. Yeah. So my prediction is it'll fade out fairly rapidly, but we'll see. 
Speaking of other card two. games by Richard Garfield that have faded out very rapidly. Oh, no. <laughs> the uh, digital one, the Dota 1 Artifact. Oh, yeah. It, I heard it was a bad. It's dropped like 98% player count since Ooh. release or something. And that was just and based... It, it, it came out in November. I think there was a beta before that, but yeah. Wasn't there a ton of backlash based on the cost of it? Yeah, there's a lot of backlash on that. They didn't manage it well. I don't think they communicated all that well about it. Valve, in general, is not great at communicating with their players. They kind of randomly come out with a statement that takes a stand on something, but they don't explain it, and then they don't enforce it consistently. They've done that more than once. And then kind of when there's an uproar in in the community, they'll kind of randomly reply without really explaining themselves um, or just not reply. So I don't know. It, it was, I watched some artifact and it has a lot of interesting things in it, but it just shot itself in the foot of it's such a targeted audience of people who play Dota, because if you don't you like, you're just not going to get so much of it. Oh, really? Um, there was, there's just kind of like, and maybe, I don't know, maybe that's not completely true. Probably if you've played a MOBA in general or understand that, that gets you at least some other way there. But there was a lot of kind of mechanics that really are explained by knowing Dota. And there's also a lot of randomness. Like you choose where to put your heroes, but their position within the lane, like which creature they're matched up across from, is random. And then also they randomly draw kind of a, an attack path of 50% of the time they go straight forward. And then 25% of the time they go left, 25% they go one right. And that just, it takes so much out of the player's hand that I won't say the better player doesn't win, but you have randomness in drawing cards out of your deck. You have randomness in your creature position. You have randomness in which way they go. And then you have randomness of which items you can buy on top of some kind of non-intuitive mechanisms Mm -hmm. and a bad (laughs) or some people would say greedy monetization policy so it's not that hard to see why it failed it's just kind of disappointing honestly because it could have been cool yeah it it seems to have been a failure i mean on the plus side for uh garfield is that magic the gathering arena which i'm i he's got to get some cut of that i assume he's got his He's getting a little bit out of every magic-related thing. Uh, Arena is very, very fun, and I'm still very much enjoying playing yeah. lots of it. It's a fantastic implementation, and I play it nearly every day. Well, just in terms of him, like, Artifact is has kind of failed, but there's a lot of hype initially, and Keyforge seems to be declining. I'm not sure if that's true, but we both think it's kind of going to fade out. I but don't know. I haven't, we looked, I haven't played we looked, Keyforge in a long time. We looked the other weekend and what, there were 600,000 decks registered or something like that? Oh, yeah, 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 with Keyforge. So I just like... For some reason I thought you said Hearthstone. Um, Oh, no, I'm sure he has made a lot of money on both of those games, even if they don't have much longevity. Yeah, I mean, good for him. I mean, he's really done a thing. And he was the original inventor of Netrunner, the greatest deck (laughs) construction game of all time. Yeah. Rest in peace. We need another moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> another moment of silence. For another Runner. ritual silence for now. Man, we ended this one on kind of a downer, but uh, that's life. So uh, we'll talk to you again soon, everyone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't have anything. I, I thought we, we 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 covered all the games. We had some good discussions of them. It's late. I'm tired. Podcast I'm over. I gotta people. get up early tomorrow. Yeah, you got to get up early. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Check me out on social media, specifically Facebook and Twitter. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or various other podcasting things. And if you, again, if you would like to support us, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. You can get in our Discord, get to watch our podcast recordings live where you hear all of the nonsense that I edit out. Me saying things like Charles Cuddick, although I guess I've now said it so it's not a Patreon exclusive. Sorry guys. Anyways, we'll talk to you all again soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.